Dan and Lois, good morning, everyone. Uh, please t- oh, find a Bible and turn with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. Ephesians, chapter 4. And in the red Bibles that are on the rows that you're in, Ephesians, chapter 4, if you need it, is on page 1069. One of the ways to think about this world we live in, to think about God's creation, is to think about it as a song. Uh, There's actually a hymn, uh, it's called Creation is a Song, a song that we can see. Um, And and so one of the ways for us to to think about our part in this world is that we actually get to join our lives in this song of God that has been going on since the very beginning of time. I kind of like that. Uh, that as you read Genesis 1 and 2, and as God is, is creating this world, you get that there's almost a sort of melody to it. There's a sort of rhythm to it. And it's almost as if everything that God is creating, every physical thing, has a purpose to play in God's song. It's, it's a bit like a symphony. Uh, I don't know how many, how many people enjoy sort of orchestral music and Um, things like that. But there's something really, it's not my preferred style of music, and yet there's something almost transcendent about it, isn't it? When you you hear an orchestra that is playing, where everybody knows uh, their role, and they play their instrument, and they submit their instrument for the good of the whole, it's beautiful, it's moving. Sometimes you can almost find yourself in tears listening to, to a great orchestra. And I think that's how creation is supposed to work. That creation is a song, uh, that everything that God has made in the beginning has a role to play in this beautiful symphony where God is conducting. It is his song. It is his, you know, tempo that we, you can hold on to that for a second. Um, it, it's his tempo that, that we're following. We're taking our cues from God. Um, and in fact, science tells us this. Do you know, uh, science tells us that everything, not even every living thing, but everything that is made of matter, which is everything, is vibrating. This table is um, as inanimate as it could possibly be, and yet this table is vibrating at a given frequency. Your chair that you're sitting on, it, it, has, a, it has a tone to it. Uh, your, your clothing... Uh, if you had ears that could hear, you know, if they were finely tuned enough, you could hear the color orange because it vibrates at a given frequency. And so you have this sense, even science, like it tells us that, that everything is sort of humming in this world and is a part of this, this beautiful symphony that God has created. Um, now, the problem is, Our lives are supposed to be sort of included in this symphony, that our lives are lived sort of to the flow of the conductor. Uh, But we find in the scriptures that uh, there was a bit of a rebellion that took place. Have you ever been watching a a symphony perform and somebody just decided, you know, this song is okay, but I'm going to do my own thing over here. Uh, It sort of disrupts the whole flow of everything, doesn't it? So uh, what we find in the Bible is that this this beautiful, what was intended to be a beautiful symphony, where everybody is playing the song of their creator, uh, there was a bit of a rebellion. And some of us decided we want to play more cowbell, right? We... um, we, we want to play our own instrument at our own pace, at our own volume, and we're going to play our own song. And what happened is it just sort of caused chaos. Chaos. And then other people started sort of joining in, and, and pretty soon you don't have this beautiful symphony effect. You have a bit of a cacophony, right? It's, a, it's, it's, it's chaotic. Um, and so as we think about the church, This next five weeks is going to be, we're talking about the church. We're talking about the the way God has designed the church. The church is supposed to be that group of people within this sort of creation that has gone awry that again begins playing the beautiful symphony of God. These people who have turned their hearts to the conductor, who have said, no, I am going to submit my gifts, my instrument, if you will, to the conductor. And I'm going to use my life, every piece of energy I have to serve the needs of the whole. 
of, the, of this, this beautiful symphony. And it's supposed to be beautiful music. As people see the church, they're supposed to say, and there's something beautiful that's going on over here. There's supposed to be beautiful music uh, that is produced. And this is a bit of a vision, I think, that, that Paul sort of puts out. And I want to read, this is going to be our text over the next couple of weeks. I want to read Ephesians 4. And re- listen to this text with that in mind, of this, this incredible unity um, that Paul is, is calling us to as a church. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 1 to 16. As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, Just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. There is one conductor we are to follow. But to each one of us, grace has been given. We each have our own instrument to play as Christ has apportioned it. And that is why it says, he ascended on high. When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to people. Now, what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascends higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service. So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and the cunning craftiness of people and their deceitful schemings. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ, from him. This whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And this is a beautiful image Paul paints. This is the church. This is, this is us. Um, and, and he's calling us. Paul is calling us into our future as a church. One of the things I love about the book of Ephesians, and I know I've talked about it a couple, a couple times uh, over the years, is that Paul doesn't give one command in the book of Ephesians, which is not normal for him, right? He's writing into a church, and he's writing to them uh, to to help keep them on track. It's a church that he's planted, and he cares for, and he wants to make sure they stay faithful. But the first three chapters of Ephesians are all just reminding the church who they are. You have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. You've been called, you've been equipped, you've been empowered. For the first three chapters, Paul just goes and he reminds you, the church, this is who you are. And then he gets to chapter four, and this is when he gives his first sort of command, and he says, now live a life worthy of this calling you have received. This instrument that you have been given, would you play it well? Would you use your life for the beauty and the glory of God? Um, Now, to kind of switch metaphors a little bit, Paul uses this idea of a body. And I want to talk about that just a a little bit here. This idea of a body. Um, And there's body language throughout the New Testament that the church is called the body of Christ. And I think it's significant to think about ourselves that way, that we are the body of Christ. That means uh, a, a couple of different things. And number one, we're set, we are called the body of Christ, and Christ is the head of the body. It, it is Christ that is Lord. Uh, he is the one who is leading us, directing us, guiding us. He is the sort of the essential component of the church. Christ is the head of the body. If the body sort of is removed from the head, the body is lifeless, Right? And so we, like as a church, we have to constantly remind ourselves that Jesus is Lord. That Jesus is Lord. That uh, he's the one who directs and we follow him. I think it's, I remember taking a psychology class. Some of you ever took a psychology class? Uh, and you have to study, and it was the most boring thing in the world. Um, sorry if you love biology. Uh, did I say biology? 
I, psychology. Sorry if you love psychology or biology. That's boring too. Um, but uh, but I the whole like intro to psychology is this study of how like these neural pathways connect between our brain and our our sensory parts of our body, our fingertips, and there's constant communication between our head and these parts of the world that are like touching things and experiencing things and sensing things. There's constant communication back and forth. And I think it, while it was sort of like, I have to study this, uh, I think it is a beautiful image of like the Jesus is the head of the body, the church. That there's this constant feedback and communication. That we're constantly putting ourselves in a place where we're getting our instruction from Jesus. We're submitting to him. Uh, and in this life of prayer that keeps us connected with our head. So Christ is the head of the body. And if that's true, if the church is a body, then the church is a living, breathing community of people who submit to Jesus as Lord. What is the church? The church is a living, breathing community of people who submit to Jesus as Lord. Do you know when, when we stand, um, whoever it may be, whether it's Cindy um, or one of our song leaders or myself or another pastor, um, if you notice the language, we try not to say, welcome to church. Because this isn't church. You are the church. Welcome to the church, right? This is welcome to you. You are the church. The church is the living, breathing community of people who have submitted their lives to Jesus as Lord. And our language matters. We don't come to church. We are the church. Uh, We exist as the body of Christ. It is a living, breathing thing that we are a part of. Um, Now, The church is not an organization. The church is not an institution. We are a body, a living body, connected to one another and supporting one another. Like, there's some structure, right? I mean, there's some, you say, well, like, Eric, you say the the church isn't an institution or an organization, but there is some organization to it, right? And we have some leadership structures and all of that. And like, yeah, I think so. There is some structure to support the body, but those structures are not the body itself. They're not the church. You, the, the living, breathing community of people who submitted their lives to Jesus, this is the church. And I think this is important for us, this image in our minds. And the third thing about the body is that no one part of the body is more important than another. Um, so my daughter, my, we, we, we think sometimes that like, well, yeah, there, there are more important parts of the body than others, of course. Uh, well, so my daughter the other day, she's walking through the house, and she's walking pretty quickly, and uh, she's carrying a bunch of stuff, so she isn't looking where she's going, and she slams her toe on the coffee table. How many of you have been there, right? You know that feeling of just, like, it's just a toe. I mean, just suck it up, right? It's just a toe. Do you know what happens to my daughter when she just hits her toe? Her legs give out and her brain stops working, and all of a sudden her eyes start watering. Her toe is connected to the rest of her body. Uh, and, and so this is this, this, this image that Paul paints here in the New Testament, that the body, that there is no one part of the body that is more important than another. I have a friend who, uh, who spent months training for this multi-day hiking trip with his friends. And about one day into the trip, they made, made it to their first camp, set up camp, and he had a blister on his foot. And that blister cost him his whole trip. He couldn't hike anymore for a tiny blister. Uh, I did a 100-mile bike ride a couple of years ago. And uh, you can train for a 100-mile bike ride. And you can have the strongest legs in the world, but if you can't sit on the seat, you cannot ride 100 miles. Every part of the body is important, and there is no part that is more important than another. And this is why, so Paul uses this language in 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, He talks about the body. Now, here's the beautiful thing, if we understand what Paul is doing, because it's revolutionary. Paul didn't invent this idea of the the body as being kind of a community of people. Romans and Greeks actually used this image. They talked about, hey, Roman society is, is like a body. But here's how they used it. Some of us are more noble than others, they would say. Some of us have been given privilege. We have this divine mandate to be the head, to give direction. And you, you need to just know that, well, you're just a foot. Or you're, you're just a leg. 
right? And you can sever a foot or you can sever a leg and still live a long life, but if you sever the head, well, you're hopeless. We, the more noble ones, we are the head. And so Romans and Greeks use this body image as a way to keep people in their place, to say, you're a part of this whole thing, but you're a supporting part, and you really don't matter that much, but you just know your role, do your thing, and don't get too big for your britches. And so what does Paul do? It, this, this is everybody who he's writing to in Ephesus and in, in Corinth would have known this body uh, image, and they would have, it would have been uh, told to them to just sort of keep yourself in your place. And here's how Paul sort of turns the body on its head, right? Here's what he says in 1 Corinthians, starting in verse 20. He says, as it is, uh, chapter 12, verse 20, as it is, there are many parts, but there's one body. Now the eye, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable, we treat with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that all its parts should have equal concern for the other. Do you hear what Paul's doing? Sort of turning this whole body image on its on its head. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. You are an, an indispensable part of the body of Christ. You are a valued part of the body of Christ. You have gifts. You have gifts that need to be expressed for the body to be everything God intends it to be. Do you, do you see that? Do you see the people around you that way? The people sitting on the row that you're in? The people who are in your Sunday school class? So we say, like, we need each other. I need you to speak into my life. I need you to, to help me see blind spots, things that I don't know that I don't know. I need to learn from what God is doing in your life, from what God is saying to you. We need each other. Um, sometimes we talk about, like, well, isn't my faith just between me and Jesus? I'm kind of one of those people, I don't like to be really like upfront about my faith, and so my faith is just kind of right here. It's just kind of me and Jesus, it's private. Well, that idea of a private faith is a very new invention, uh, right? Because this is not the image in the New Testament church. We are, a, we are a community of faith connected to one another, and we need each other like the body needs every part. Um, so faith is personal, but it's never individual. Let me say that again. Faith is personal, but it is never individual. Our hearts must be, be, be connected to Jesus. We must make a personal sort of decision to follow Jesus, to surrender to him as Lord. But if that's where it stops, if I live this sort of personalized me and Jesus sort of lifestyle, I am not going to be adding the value to the body that God has intended to me. Faith is always personal, but it's never individual. And we is bigger than me. We is bigger than me. We must be together. Uh, we need each other. The mission of God is too great for any one of us to carry it alone. The mission of God is too great for any one of us to not play our part in the body. Do you see yourself? It doesn't matter age. It doesn't matter station of life. It doesn't matter like capacities. Do you see yourself as a valuable part of the body of Christ? You have gifts that God has given you to play. Uh, the story of the journey this, this morning. Did you hear that story? Uh, a young couple, a young family from our church, they're sheep farmers. And as I talked to him, he's like, you know, we're just sheep farmers. Like out here in Yoder, Kansas, like what, what is God going to do with us? And a man from Senegal comes, a Muslim man, and starts wanting to do business. And so this, this young family in Yoder, Kansas, has this opportunity to love this man from the uttermost parts of the earth who's coming to his farm, and he gets to share the love of Jesus with him. He has a connection with that man that none of us in here will ever have, right? And all God asks of him is to be faithful. Just be faithful. You don't have to be anybody else. You don't have to, like, leave your career and do something different. You just have to be faithful to what I bring to you. What is God asking you to be faithful in? How is he wanting you to use 
your gifts. So we are part of the body. Now, this passage in Ephesians 4 like, is broken down into three sort of distinct uh, parts. Verses 1 to 6, Paul talks about unity. Unity, unity, unity. There's this, this incredible sense where he says in verse 3, he says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Go back to that orchestra image for a second. Um, we, have, we have things in common as we play. There's this uh, a tempo that's being set for us. There's a key that we're playing in. And, and so there's there these things that hold it all together. We know who the conductor is, that it is Jesus who's leading. So there's unity. But then in verses 7 to 11, um, Paul talks about the diversity of gifts. He says now, like, in the unity, there is one God, one Father, I mean, one faith, one baptism, one Lord. He talks about all of the unity, but then he says, but we have diversity. Every one of us has different gifts to offer. And he goes on to, to highlight five giftings in the church that must be present, I believe, for the church to reach maturity. And those giftings are the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, or another name for shepherd is pastor, or teachers. The, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, pastors, teachers. Sometimes these are called the fivefold giftings. Uh, sometimes they're called apest, um, just using the first initial from, from all five of these, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. Here's what I would want to say this morning is that every one of us in this room has one of these giftings, one primary gifting. And many of us have, you, you have more than one that you function in, but you have one of these giftings. And these, I believe, are a part of what God is asking us. This, this is the instrument we're called to bring. This is the role we're to play in the body of Christ. What does this gifting look like? For you. And this is what we want to spend the next five weeks on, talking about specifically these five roles so we can better understand how we're called to use them. And so what I want to do this morning is just give a brief introduction to each of these five, because um, I think we might start to be able to identify ourselves here with these five things. Um, the apostles. Um, the apostles, we have, um, and I think these gifts are evident not just within the church, but they're, inter they're evident in God's created order. So people who aren't a part of the church, they've never surrendered their lives to Jesus, I think they're apostles in the world, right? How do you know an apostle when you see one? Well, these are people who are pioneers, uh, entrepreneurs. They like to build systems and organize things and get people into the right places. Um, they're people who are energized by starting something new or turning an organization around. You know any people like that? You know, can some of you start to see yourselves maybe as that? I mean, these are, this is an apostolic role in society. Um, in the, inside the church, the apostles are the sent ones, right? They're the ones who extend the faith by moving into new territories of mission and church planning, etc. cetera. Uh, the apostle is constantly asking the question, what's next? What's next? Uh, so this is, this is an essential role for the church, that we have apostles who recognize their giftings and are playing that role in the church. Uh, uh, prophets. What, what's the role of a prophet in the church? Well, um, first of all, in, in just creation, the role of a prophet is they tend to be artists and they tend to be passionate about justice, about creation care, about issues, and they call people to it. They speak with passion about issues. Um, prophets within the church are passionate about keeping the church faithful to God, and they are bold enough to speak up and bring critique when, when it's needed. Um, prophets are needed in the church. They're sort of the mouthpiece. It's like, no, we're missing something here. The question the prophet asks is, what are we missing? Where have we gone off? What needs to be brought back to center? So the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists is the third one. Evangelists um, tend to be energizers. They're people who are interested, who get people interested in what they're interested in. You know any of those people? If they listen to a new album, you know about it. And you've probably already bought it because they've convinced you it's the best thing they've ever heard. Uh, if they eat at a great restaurant, you have probably eaten at that restaurant because they've convinced you that it's the best restaurant, you know, or they've seen a movie. They're, these are people who just naturally, like, they recruit people to the cause. Um, and we, if, if you know somebody who begins a conversation by saying, hey, I had this great talk with the person on the airplane, they're probably an evangelist, right? They're the only people who will talk to the people next to them on the airplane or at the grocery store. Whatever. These people, they just strike up conversations. 
uh, all around. In the church, evangelists are gifted to communicate the gospel and to invite other people into the kingdom. The question the evangelist asks is, who needs to hear this? Who needs to hear? So we've got the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, or another name is pastor, uh, but we'll call it shepherd for these purposes here. In creation, um, just in natural society, shepherds tend to be compassionate people who see those who are hurting and they want to bring help. Uh, shepherds tend to be uh, nurses. They're involved in, in the medical field or social workers, some sort of advocacy, counselors, teachers. You can see shepherds because they just move toward other people who are in pain. In the church, shepherds are nurturing people who, again, move toward those in pain, and they want to make sure everyone feels loved, included, and valued. Do, can you recognize shepherds around you who just, like, they just sort of want to, like, gather people together. They want to make sure every voice is heard. want to make sure everybody feels loved and a part of the whole. We need shepherds in the church. Shepherds always ask the question, how can I care? How can I care? And the last one is teaching. The teacher um, are, tend to be thinkers, people who love ideas and can communicate them effectively. People who love philosophy, maybe are professors or teachers. But in the church, uh, teachers are able to teach scripture in a way that resonates and brings understanding. How can I explain this is the question they're asking. Can you start to see yourself in one of these five gifts? Can you start to identify apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers? Now, Paul says in Ephesians 4, all five of them must be active and present in the church for the church to reach the third sort of portion of this scripture, which is maturity. It says the reason all five of these gifts, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers are given is so that we can equip the saints for works of ministry. Um, All five of these are needed to make this happen. There is a a beauty when all five of these are fully, fully engaged and fully active. Now, of those five, the apostles, prophets, shepherds, evangelists, and teachers, which two gifts do you think have been most emphasized in the church in your lifetime? Have you heard much talk about apostles? Apostles? Or how about evangelists in the church? I'm not talking about like the the evangelistic meetings, but evangelists in the church. Like somebody has said to you maybe, I think you might have a a gifting of evangelism. How about the prophetic gift? Hey, we need people who keep us on center, who hear from God and keep us faithful to God's mission. How about pastors or shepherds? We hear a lot about that one. How about teachers? We hear a lot about that one. See, what's happened, I think, in... um, the last stretch of history in the church is that we have built the church on two of the giftings, shepherds and teachers. And those who have the gift of apostleship or uh, evangelism or, or a prophetic gifting, what ends up happening to them is they don't find a place in the church, and so they go and they begin a parachurch organization. They, they, they find their place to use their gifts somewhere outside of the walls of the church. And why do we have churches that are shrinking and dying? I think one of the reasons is because we don't have apostles, we don't have prophets, we don't have evangelists who are energizing the church forward into mission. And so I think this series is about helping us reclaim all five of these giftings, helping us identify where am I in this gift mix and how do I play this role? How many of you know pentatonics? How many of you, um, are you familiar with pentatonics? Carl, is that video going to play? No, not going to play. Okay, so there's this, you can, you can look them up later today, but there's this group called the pen, uh, pentatonics and there are five of them. And they each, I thought it was this beautiful image of what happens when all five of these gifts come together in unity, but in the diversity of their giftings, there's this beautiful harmony that's created. It's a beautiful thing to watch and to see. What is the gifting that you have been given? Would you begin asking that question this week? Would you begin praying, God, what is it that you've, you've asked me to do of these five things, to be an apostle, a prophet, a shepherd, an evangelist, a teacher? God, how are you wanting to use me, to use my gift, to build up the body of Christ so that God's people can be equipped for works of ministry and the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach a unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. One temptation we're going to face is that we're, 
sometimes we end up believing the lie that says, I can't add my gift to the body until I'm better at it. I, until I get my life sorted out, I have nothing to offer. And I can't tell you how many times I've, I've heard people say that in one way or another. Um, my life is a wreck, and I, I'm still struggling with all of these things, and so I can't really be a part of the church, and I can't, like, contribute anything of value until I get my life sorted out. And what is that communicating again? Where is faith? It's right here, personal. Me and, when me and Jesus get better, then I'll come back into the church, and then I'll use my gifts. Do you know what's going to happen? You're never going to get me and Jesus figured out because you and Jesus were meant to be you and Jesus and the body of believers. Please do not believe that lie that says, I have nothing to contribute until I get fixed. Do you know how we get fixed? It's in the context of the relationship. It's when we have other people who are speaking into our life and are loving us and caring for us and walking with us. We need each other to mature personally and to mature as a church. God, we thank you that from the very beginning, you have set the tone, you have set the key. And God, you have handed out instruments for us to play. And God, uh, we come to you and we just submit ourselves. We submit our our whole lives, our whole being, God, everything you have given us. And God, we want to play your song. God, if we have just sort of uh, jumped off on our own and started doing our own thing and playing our own song, God, we want to repent of that. And we want to come back to you and just surrender to you. God, we, we trust that this song is going to go on. Uh, we believe, God, the, in the words of, of the old benediction as it was, in the beginning, is now and will be forevermore, a world without end. Amen.